Okay, so the number seems stable. So if you want, uh, we can start. Okay, let me so, see how to share the screen. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, uh, I want to welcome everybody to um, these new lectures uh, of the TH Lear series. This is the very first lecture after the summer stop, so in the autumnal period. So it's nice to see you all again here. And today we have the pleasure to have Lorenzo Bartolini as a lecturer. Uh, Lorenzo is uh, an expert about uh, holographic QCD and holographic computation. And uh, uh, he earned his PhD in Pisa and he has been a postdoc in Vienna and is currently a postdoc uh, at the Yen University in, uh, in China. So uh, before starting, I just want to remind you that uh, feel free to ask questions, any question at any time, just unmute yourself and ask, or uh, if you prefer, you can write in the chat and I can uh, read it uh, for, uh, for Lorenzo. Uh, so feel free to uh, stop the lecture and ask questions because this is the, the spirit of this, uh, of this series of lectures. So without further ado, Lorenzo, please. Okay, so thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, inviting me. And so it's always a pleasure to come back to Florence, even if virtually. And, but that's the best we could do this time. So hopefully soon can be in person. And so for these two lectures, which I think is a very interesting uh, uh, approach to studying new topics, uh, as young researchers, instead of shorter seminars or longer courses, um, I decided to divide in these two days uh, in, in the following way. So in the first day, we will have some uh, uh, preliminary setup of the topics that um, will be needed to see how the, the, the main topic of the talks actually uh, arise. And the main topic is holographic UCD. So um, an alternative way to compute QCD quantities uh, uh, that can prove themselves challenging by using uh, uh, the regular QCD as a, as a quantum field theory, um, but employing instead the holographic approach. And we will see what we mean by that. So the, the overview of the talk of the lectures will be as following. So we have on the, this is a weird color. We choose a better color, okay. So on the first day, so today, we have on the first hour or approximately the first hour, we'll have a review of string theory, which is the natural, uh, um, I say the natural, uh, playground in which holography was born. And then we will have an hour or so of uh, review of the idea that lead to ADS CFT. So the holographic correspondence. And then tomorrow, now the, the, this first day will be quite, let's say, sketchy. Is because of course those are very wide topics and we don't want to have a course on string theory or a course on ADS CFT and of course if you want to have a course on string theory uh, there are people that are better suited than me to to have a course on string theory but we need to see uh, how the ideas of holography uh, and the object that you need to talk about holography come from so we will uh, bring some results some other we will just uh, uh, we will just uh, say that they arise in a in a more uh, in a more sketchy way, but at the end we will have all the ingredients to build the the model that we will use to to see how to perform computations in a top down holographic UCD approach. So on the second day, we will introduce holographic UCD. and especially the model that I worked the most on, which is the Witten-Sakai-Sugimoto model, which is the top-down 
approach to holographic UCD, or the most important top-down approach. And uh, the fact that it's a top-down approach uh, justifies the first day of introduction. So there is a lot of, uh, of setup from, uh, from uh, fundamental theory. And then we will have, uh, uh, if there is time, but I think there will be, we will see how to uh, compute some observables, compute, let's say, an observable. Our goal is to, is to, is to give the complete computation of some observable. And I am thinking, I, I still have to be completely convinced about what, but I'm thinking about one that I computed for my uh, master thesis. Uh, which is the electric dipole moment of the neutron. And this is because it's the first time that I have the occasion to explain completely with every, with every um, detail how to compute it. And also because it's a quantity that is quite difficult to, to compute in QCD because of the uh, importance of non-perturbative phenomena. So there's a lot of non-perturbative physics going on. Okay, and so the, the usual approach with QCD that you can have at high energies with perturbation theory breaks down, and then you have to use effective field theories, which are a bit of a bottom-up approach. So without further ado, let's go to, uh, to talk about string theory. Now, of course, someone of you, I've been told maybe, are already working in string theory, and for you, of course, you would probably know a lot more than me on the topic and would be just the usual uh, refreshing, uh, uh, um, how you say, usual refreshing uh, little cartoon of how string theory works. And so at least I hope will be entertaining if not useful. So let us start with the uh, usual point particles. Three point particles. And you want to build an action for this particle. So we know that uh, in a special relativity, you have your three dimensional space and then time. And you can see this point particle are sweeping over time, what is called the word line, right? So, and this can be parameterized by some curve gamma of some parameter tau. And you can ask what, uh, what action governs this, uh, this free motion. And the answer is quite well known, is that the action is proportional to the integral over ds, where ds squared is the metric, dx mu, dx mu. Let's, let's put explicitly mu eta uno. And this object here is proportional to the length of the word line. And so to see, uh, you can parameterize this word line, of course, and uh, with some parameter t. And what happens is that you obtain that the action is minus m and times the integral over the square root of minus ds squared over dt uh, squared times dt. And then, yeah, I should say it's like something like this. And then what you end up with in the end is uh, minus m integral of the square root minus x mu dot x mu dot eta mu nu. 
التي اوكي اند وين يو يوز وين يو يوز ذا ماتريك ان يو رايت ذيس ان از ا فانكشن اوف ذا سبيد ذا فيلوسيتي اتس 1 ماينس ب سكويرد وير وي هاف يوزد ذا يونيت سو سي ايكوال 1 Okay. And okay, well, that's familiar. And uh, we gave a, um, a brief overview of this to see what happens with strings. And okay, now let's say we want to move to uh, free moving strings in a flat space time. And um, we ask ourselves, okay, this time uh, uh, this argument is not really uh, working because I don't have this word line. What I have now with the strings what we have now with strings is that we have uh, um, so the string is a one-dimensional object let's say it's a closed strings that forms like a ring and it sweeps a two-dimensional surface as it moves over time. And then we can parameterize the surface with two parameters and give some, uh, some description of this. And the parameter space will look something like this two-dimensional space, let's call the parameters sigma and tau. And so in parameter space, it is sigma and the tau will give this element of area of parameter space. Now to see what we can uh, use as, a, as an action for this, uh, for this object here. Let's start with physical strings. Um, so let's start with a physical world sheet. So let's take uh, not a world sheet, but a surface in a flat space. So a real surface, two dimensional surface. And since this was proportional to the length of the world line, we can ask ourselves, uh, we, we can think to use the area of this surface as a as an action okay so for a, for a space like 3d dimensions we have that the ta is proportional to the the sigma that now i introduce those are these vectors and the, these infinitesimal vectors are the ones that correspond on the surface to the infinitesimal uh, to the differentials on the parameter space and uh, so what we create at this point is uh, this object if sigma squared dv tau squared minus dv sigma dot d v tau squared all under the square root and so our area functional will be essentially the integral over the sigma and the tau of, um, as before, of x, let's call them prime and dot, x prime squared, x dot squared minus x prime dot x dot all squared. All right, where the prime denotes the 
differentiation with respect to sigma and the dot, the differentiation respect to tau. So this is an area functional for our uh, three-dimensional, uh, for our surface in three-dimensional flat space. And we move to the space-time analogy as we did for the word line, and we end up with, a, with an area functional that is the sigma, the tau, and then we have x prime, x dot nu squared squared minus x uh, prime mu x um, prime mu and the same with the dots. Okay. Okay, so this uh, kind of analogy lead us uh, to the identification of what will be our, uh, our first free string action. So this is still not the action, this is proportional to the action. So we introduce the action, which let me name it first, is called the Nambu Goto action. And this is given simply by this, let's call S Nambugoto minus T0, which is an overall constant, the integral from initial time to final time, integral from zero to some coordinate sigma one, which denotes the endpoints of the strings, the sigma, and then the integral over x, where the dot products, I use it for shortness sake, is this mu mu contraction. And the square those, of course, is performed by contraction with themselves. All right, so, okay, now we have an action. And with the action, you can do physics now. So we can, uh, we can ask ourselves, for example, what are the equation of motions and uh, what boundary conditions to impose on them? And to derive the equation of motion, we perform some variations. Okay, we, we have to uh, perform a variation that looks like x mu goes to x mu plus x mu. And so the action as a result will go into S plus delta S. And without bringing all the calculations, our result for this is that the variation of the action is the integral over the same span of coordinates. And we have this object here, which we recognize easily. Uh, and the x mu over the sigma. Now, we can define some quantities that would be useful. So we define these essentially are conjugate momenta because they are the derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to x prime mu. And this is equal to minus t0. Uh, I think I forgot an overall constant here somewhere. Okay. And here we have x dot times x prime, x prime, x dot mu minus x dot squared, x prime mu. 
over and here we have x dot times x prime squared minus x dot squared x prime squared all with a square root and then of course we have the corresponding stuff for the tau coordinate so it's the same and essentially you have to exchange the dot with the prime and so i avoid writing it again so at this stage we can write our variation in a more useful way so the variation of the action at this point is given by this double integral again and you have p tau mu delta x mu dot plus p sigma mu delta x prime mu which in turn when we use uh, when we uh, integrate by parts as usually what you do to obtain the equation of motion you integrate by parts and you obtain some total derivative which will usually be sent to zero and then you obtain uh, the equation of motion because the the integral has to vanish for every variation okay let's see what happens here here it happens that we have this integral over the tau and the sigma and then we have let me use this notation now instead of writing the over the tau because it's shorter and then we have p tau mu x mu and then we have uh, the sigma p sigma mu delta x mu and then we also have the piece that usually is the most important which is this combination of derivatives of this term here when the, you move the derivatives from the de from the variation to the other piece okay so this is a huge integral okay now we we analyze this piece by piece so the first term is the term that for our point particle was taken uh, to vanish okay you have uh, this is a boundary term but it's a boundary in time so you can take variations that on uh, at initial time and final time vanish and so okay this can be safely set to zero and it's not interesting for us and this last term is the usual one that gives us the equation of motion okay so this is equations of motions very interesting we have the equations of motion and but there is this one too okay and i use another color because it's different we have this piece that this is new this is created because the string now is a is an object that is extended in space and it's not not anymore a point so you have this uh, sigma direction on the word sheet and what happens with this point is that it is a total derivative too and so you can think of it as an integral from tau, tau e to tau f over the tau and then you have this object this sigma mu delta x mu to be evaluated at the two extremes of our range for the parameter sigma so if we want to set this to zero these are boundary conditions for our for our string so this gives some boundary conditions for our equations of motion and how many are those well those are two times d plus one boundary conditions because you have two endpoints for every string so two coordinates at the extremes 
And so we have two possibilities. You have two possibilities for this to vanish. It's a product, so either one or the other vanishes. It, there is not much more choice. So one is that p mu sigma of tau and one, uh, let's call it, it's for everyone, OK? It's 0, let's call it 0 for sigma 1, OK? So this coordinate can be 0, sigma 1. So you have two possibilities, and this must be 0. This means that the string has three endpoints. And one. And the other possibility is that is this variation that is zero at the endpoints. So one of these two endpoints. Okay, so from this perspective, the the string cannot move in one of the direction in space, which is uh, kind of weird if we think of strings as free objects, but we'll see that this is very, probably the most important observation of this lecture. So these are called Dirichlet boundary conditions. And so it can be Dirichlet with respect to the direction mu. Okay, so the existence of this, of this, uh, conditions here, so lead us to assume that in this context of, uh, we, we took the free string theory and some Dirichlet boundary conditions can, uh, can appear for our string. So can they be bound in some directions? Is this some unnatural assumptions, a really exotic uh, scenario in which the string doesn't move? And if it doesn't move, then okay, we, our equations of motion work, but maybe it's not realized in nature. Well. The, the interpretation is that there are objects in uh, string theory which are extended, are not merely strings, but are extended in more directions and on which the string endpoints can be attached. And those are called D brains, where the D stands for Dirichlet. So the picture is that along some direction in space time, you have a brain which have a higher dimension than the string, equal or higher dimension than a string. And then the string is attached with its endpoints to this brain. Or maybe you have multiple brains and strings can stretch from one to another. And this kind of construction enforces these Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay. So we will see later the, some arguments for the existence of these, these objects that we didn't put by hand in the theory at this stage, right? They, they arise from the action of free strings. Okay, so for every string, you can impose a combination of Dirichlet and, and what, are called, what are called Neumann boundary conditions along the directions that you desire, depending on where are placed the brains. Okay, now, uh, now that we, okay, you, you took the free theory and you derived the equations of motion and the boundary conditions, you've seen interesting things about the existence of uh, maybe extended objects. And let's say now you want to take a step further and, and create a quantum theory of the strings. Okay, you encounter a problem. And the problem is that this, uh, this action here, the Nambugoto action, here is very hard to quantize. And this is essentially because of the square root that appears here. But luckily enough, there is an action that is uh, classically equivalent. So produces the same equations of motion and is still, uh, uh, and still gives you an array functional. Sorry, I heard some rumors, okay. 
And so this action is called the Polyakov action. Okay, so um, the Polyakov action with, I, I give you here, still this factor overall, the same parameters. And this time we introduce an, aux an auxiliary field, which we call gamma. And now I explain what these indices and objects mean. Uh, this is an N and X nu eta. Okay, so this is the Polyakov action. And we have introduced this gamma man, which is essentially a metric on the world sheet. And MN takes the value sigma or tau, essentially. Okay, so this is a, a metric on the world sheet. And when we perform the variation of this thing, we obtain this expression. And uh, this square root of uh, um, who does gravity knows it's the minus the determinant of this metric, the square root of minus the determinant of the metric. So we obtain this variation of gamma, mm. So we, we are uh, performing a variation with respect to this metric, to this auxiliary field, gamma. X nu, the m, x nu, minus gamma m, n, gamma p, q. X mu dq x mu. Okay, so and this leads us to the identification of this gamma mn with two times some function of sigma and tau. And the structure, the tensor structure on the word sheet is this one the x mu, the n x mu, eta mu. Nu. Um, so let us be clear that we have two metrics now, no? right? We have F, eta and we have gamma. And gamma is a metric on the world sheet and eta is the metric of space time. So there are different things. And in principle, gamma is not the, the pullback of the space time metrics on the world sheet. But we see now that it's essentially the same thing. And this is given by gamma q. X mu to the minus one. Now the the thing that is important here is that let us write this in red since this one is important is that f of sigma and tau is not a physical quantity. So you can change this. And this essentially doesn't change the physics. And this, why is this the case? Well, you have a factor of square root of minus gamma in the action, and you have a factor of gamma mn. And this goes as f to the sigma tau, and this goes as f to the minus one sigma tau. And so in the action, they can set each other. All right, so you can rescale these functions and you can rescale this metric. And this doesn't change the action. And this is obviously um, an artifact of the two-dimensional surface. So uh, the physical content, so we can say that the physical content in gamma M N is, let's call it G M N, which is the pullback, is the induced metric on the world sheet. 
but the theory at this point has uh, an additional symmetry. So this only happens uh, in uh, in two dimension. Only happens in d equal to, and so it's a crucial aspect of the fact that the theory is made with strings, and and also happens for conformal theories. So it's more rare case, but I mean for for these two dimensional surfaces, you have always this thing. And so we introduce this new symmetry of the theory that we have once we introduce this action for uh, the quantum description of string theory, which goes under the name of, of vile symmetry. And it's a symmetry that sends gamma mn into the same matrix scaled with some conformal factor and without touching the space-time coordinates. So at this stage, if we look back at our, at our action, and we keep in mind that this uh, gamma matrix here is uh, essentially uh, the, the physical quantity that is encoded here is the induced metric on the word sheet, then we can say that at this stage, the theory is uh, D scalars coupled to two-dimensional gravity. OK, now one wants to perform the quantization, which can be done with this, uh, with this action here. And I will not go into the quantization because it takes a long time to do the computations and it's not really relevant. We, we only want to know what states appear in this theory. So I give you directly some results. And let's start with closed strings, okay? And let's take a mass formula. So you have a string, you, you uh, see it as, you see its excitations as harmonic oscillators essentially, and you perform quantization with some constraints. And the energy of the states give you the mass of the corresponding particle that you see as a manifestation of these vibrating strings. So the mass squared for the closed string sector is given by two over a parameter called alpha prime, which is inverse to the string tension. And it exists because of historical reason. It's called the Regis law. But you can you can think of it as being uh, uh, inversely proportional to the string tension. So of course, the more tense the string, the more massive. And times two occupation numbers for essentially left and right moving excitations along this closed string minus a factor minus a a constant essentially depending on the dimension of space time. So it's, it's some sort of vacuum energy, you can call it, of the string. So these two occupation numbers here have to obey uh, a level matching constraint so that on physical states, n minus n tilde equal to zero. So, okay, right, easier, n equals n tilde. So physical states have to be of equal number n. And those are built, those are built uh, as usual with uh, a dagger and a operators. Okay, now we have this uh, mass formula and le let us write some, uh, some remarks on this uh, string spectrum. Okay, let us start with the uh, ah, okay, problem. Let us start with the problem that is quite manifest at first sight. So, 
it depends on the symmetry, but okay, let, let's start with the, with the one thing that I just said here, and then we argue a bit more later. If we want to preserve Lorentz invariance at the quantum level, and Lorentz invariance is not granted at quantum level, you encoded it in the classical action, but at quantum level, it can be spoiled. And if you want to preserve it, uh, this number appearing here, um, the, the, the dimension here has to be 26. So this number here has to be two. And so if we want to preserve Lorentz invariance, and this has to be, of course, with the, the, the generators of the, of the Poincaré algebra still have to be good generators of this algebra at the quantum level. And so for Lorentz invariance, you need to have d equals 26. OK, so we have a 26-dimensional space. And this may be a problem or not a problem, depending on how much of a, on the theoretical side you are. And, but anyway, this is temporary, and we will see why. The real problem at this stage is that the ground state that is with n equal n tilde equal zero is a tachyon. Because of course, here is minus two, you put zero and you obtain a negative square mass. And okay, this signals that there is an instability. And for now, we ignore also this problem, which is maybe it's the only real problem at this stage, if you like, 26 dimensions. Uh, but we ignore this problem because uh, once you introduce supersymmetry and you move to superstrings, which is needed, this problem disappears. So it was a problem, and it was solved with, uh, with some efforts with superstrings. So let's see what we can learn on the spectrum of strings ignoring the ill-defined part of the theory. Let us move to the first excited states. First. So the lowest states, here, you build them acting with the operators of both occupation numbers, which carry an index of the direction on which they excitate the string, and they act on the vacuum, which is some 0, 0 for the occupation numbers and some, some uh, overall momentum of the center of mass. And so it carries two index, uh, two index, and this in general will be a tensor. And how do you can uh, decompose a tensor? You have a component that is traceless symmetric and then you have a, a anti-symmetric and then you have the trace and we can give names to these objects this is usually called g nu nu and is a particle of spin 2 and it must be a graviton. So surprise, they quantize the closed strings and originally to model hadrons and to, to create some theory of strong interaction. And among all the problems, there is a graviton. And then there are other fields. So this will be less important for us, but since we maybe we'll see it later also for completeness, this is called usually with Bimunu as a notation, is called the Kalb Ramond to form. And the trace part called phi is a field called the dilaton, which will be important when we want to do interactive strings. OK, so uh, we have this uh, lowest state of the one admitted. Of course, the ground state is tachyonic, so we only ad admit now these uh, this lower-lying states. 
of uh, of string theory, and we see that it includes a graviton. And if it includes a graviton with all the with all its uh, properties that is having spin two and being massless, because when you introduce, I mean, space-time dimension is fixed. So this is uh, the 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 fact that the graviton is massless here is a prediction essentially, right? So uh, we have some string states, and we see that it includes the graviton and the dilaton. So now we want to, I mean, we, we are describing free strings in space time. And we want to also know, I mean, free, free, uh, free theories can teach you something, but kind of boring. Okay, you want things to interact to give rise to interesting phenomena. And so if we want to, I mean, if this has to be a theory that contains all interactions, we have to have some interactions in it. Okay, it cannot be a theory of all free stuff. So let us move to see how these strings interact. And we can understand something on string interactions by considering a perturbative regime, right? Then it's not written in stone that strings uh, behave at a perturbative level, but it's a good start since we understand very well interactions when, the, when we do perturbative uh, expansions, let us do the same. So again, the analogy with the, with the point particle is that interactions are inserted with uh, some local operator. So for a point particle, we have local operators. And it's not right operator, just local and of higher order in the fields. So for example, you can have a five to the fourth interaction or you can have uh, something more uh, similar to electromagnetism with uh, Dirac fields <coughs> and the electromagnetic one, and so many. And all of these are of higher order than the second in, uh, in the fields. Uh, now we, we got a problem. Now we want to promote this picture to the corresponding string and picture. And the string picture is quite clear what happens. So you have a freely propagating string. And then it, in this case, it would be a string that divides into strings, each carries some particle. And so it would do something like this division. All right. OK, but now you see some, uh, some of the problems that arise here. So this local nature tells us that the interaction happens at some definite position in space and time. It's in, if you want, the, in a Fion diagram expansion, it is a, a well-localized uh, phenomenon. But here, where does the interaction happens? So you have this whole region where it's not clear. It's, if you analyze locally the string worksheets, you go at any point and you cannot see any trace of interaction. Okay, so here every point uh, is part, let's say it's part, is part of a freely of a free string. And, and the other problem is that we have uh, a very fragile symmetry. Okay, so the other problem is that we want to introduce new operators in our action, but we have a very fragile symmetry. We have vial symmetry. And we have also additional gauge symmetry that is the reparameterization invariance of the action, which is a gauge symmetry from the point of view of the worksheet. And if you add new terms, you spoil it. So it seems you are doomed to only have three strings. But there is one, one term that you can add to the, to the string action. 
And this term, which we call S, let's call it S chi, written like this, my lambda over for pi for some normalization, where lambda is for now a free parameter, which should be some coupling constant essentially, you have this sigma, the tau, Okay, so we recognize this action because this is a Einstein-Hilbert action for the word sheet, for the word sheet metric. Okay, and now it's clear why this can be added to, the, to our action because uh, in two dimensions gravity, is, um, is a topological term. So you don't have, uh, you have quite, let's not say trivial, but it's not a dynamical uh, theory. You, you don't have dynamical degrees of freedom. You have a topological, uh, the action becomes a number that depends on the topology of this, of this word sheet. So at this stage, a sky, becomes lambda times chi. And here is clear why we call it chi. Chi is the Euler characteristic of the of a surface and is two times one minus the genus. Written very well. The genus of the surface, which is essentially the number of handles of the surface. And so you have this object here that seems to have no dynamics. Uh, so it has no effects on the equation of motions. And so how you describe interactions here? And um, if you look closely before it, it seems very, very clear that this is exactly what we want because this is not the, the interaction here must not be a local phenomenon. So it must be global. And so it can very well be a topological phenomenon. And uh, this has no effects on the equations of motion, but has effects on the path integral, as many topological aspects in field theories. So the sum over all uh, trajectories, over all uh, excitations of the strings, so you, you, have, you have this complicated path integral on the strings, now as a sum over topologies. And so you have a sum over topologies, you have an integral over the x, the gamma, e to the minus the action of the string, which becomes a sum over the genus of manifolds of e to the minus two lambda one minus g. And then you have the integral of the x, the gamma, and then the Polyakov action. Okay, so let us try to understand what is this coupling, this lambda here. I mean, this, we understood that this interaction, some, I mean, this term can help us with interactions. How so? Let us take a loop diagram for a point particle. And this has two interaction points here and here. And when we move to the string picture, this is this this diagram here, okay, that makes this kind of donut. And uh, in a QFT with the two interactions, if we assign, uh, uh, we call it GS from G strings. So it's a coupling of strings. Now we want to look at strings from far and we look at them when they look like particles. And what we see is that, oh, okay, there are two string interactions in this diagram. And in a QFT, we would have a factor of e to the 2gs as a weight to this path integral. So we identify with e to the lambda, we identify it with this gs. And 
uh, uh, okay, and essentially that's all. So we we see how this parameter is related to a coupling in a field theory. But it seems now that we introduced a new free parameter. So the theory is a bit less unique. And it's not necessarily a problem. You have two free parameters instead of one. The first one would be the, the string length, essentially the tension. But this is not actually completely true, because we can see that this, uh, this uh, coupling here is tightly related to the vacuum expectation value of one of the fields of string theory. So in a certain sense, the interaction arises from string theory. This, this uh, einstein Hilbert action, we will see that arises uh, from, uh, uh, from a low energy effective action of strings. And also the coupling constant will be a given in function of a, of a field that is the dilaton. OK, so um, what is why, why are we talking string theory here? OK, so this is a, a talk on holography, essentially. And uh, uh, usually holography is also called uh, gauge gravity duality, right? So on one side, you have gauge theories. And on the other side, you have gravities, or maybe super gravities, and in the most extreme cases, string theory. This is because our string theory contains a graviton. And if you want to take seriously uh, the string theory as a, as a theory of quantum gravity, it has to reproduce Einstein gravity. It has to reproduce general relativity. So let us see how general relativity arises from string theory. OK, so strings to general relativity. And to do this, is fairly easy. I mean, you have to take the action of the massless states. You take the action and you 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 write the action on the massless states of the background. So the action of Polyakov for the states G, I, and B that we saw before is given by minus one over again four pi alpha prime the integral over the two coordinates, the volume for here, the volume. And then we have this action. This is the low energy action. I write it without deriving it. And let me use some indices to not mix Greek with Greek. GMN plus epsilon alpha beta the alpha x m the beta x n b m n plus alpha prime r of gamma dilaton. Okay, so so now we have this. This is the action for the three lowest line states. Uh, I mean, those are components of, of one state, but those are the, the trace with symmetric, trace and antisymmetric. This GMN is by itself would not be the metric. We call it the metric because we will know it's the it, it will be the metric. But for now, it's a field. It's a spin to field that is the graviton. And we see immediately that this part of the action essentially reproduces our interaction here. But you have the dilaton instead of lambda. OK? So but we can see that it can come from here. Now, uh, if we want to keep vile symmetry, so to keep. symmetry, we want to have a vanishing trace for the energy momentum tensor. So it's the characteristic of conformal field theories. So 0 equals to t alpha alpha. And with this action, it is given by this expression. And now I tell you what are these objects. And B, epsilon alpha beta, 
x m beta x n plus alpha prime beta phi r gamma. Okay, so we have a term for every one of those fields, and these objects here are called beta functions. And essentially, the vanishing of this object is uh, mapped in the vanishing of these beta functions. Okay, so we want these beta functions to be zero, and these beta functions are given by, let's write them. We write them and these objects are minus alpha prime Rmn plus two times covariant derivative, covariant derivative phi minus one fourth of H LR, H N L R, where this object H is no one but H equals to the field strength of the Calbramont form. So it's a three form, of course. And then we have alpha prime minus one half Laplacian of this object. Uh, uh, no, not Laplacian. Ready to add, it's an L plus L phi H L M N. And this last one is alpha prime D minus 26 over 6 alpha prime minus 1 half double squared phi plus this combination of derivatives of the dilaton minus 1 over 24 and this h dot h. So I don't write all the indices. Okay, it's been long, but now we have all the set. I mean, this must be zero. And so we have these equations. And these are not hard at all to solve because we see that it's pretty simple. That BLM, we set it to zero. And uh, phi uh, can be uh, a constant phi zero on the vacuum. And uh, the dimension of space time must be 26 if you want to have any hope. And so we see that to preserve our symmetry, also we need this term to vanish and have 26 dimensions. And also, let us see up here the Ricci, the Riemann tensor for, uh, for this G mu nu or GMN must be zero. And so from here, we have Einstein equation. Okay. And there is more. The vanishing of these beta functions can be all produced by an effective action. And since, um, since it, it is derived by the low inline states of the theory, this can be regarded as an effective action for low energy string theory. And so the effective action that produces all these equations is this. So we have one over some overall constant, which we call like this because will be our Einstein, uh, uh, the, the, the constant in front of, of uh, the Einstein equations. And integral over all dimensions. minus g e to the minus 2 phi r plus 4 nabla m phi nabla uh, m phi minus 1 over 12 h dot h minus again this factor that goes away 3 alpha prime okay so this is our effective action for uh, these lower light states 
in closed string theory. And we can see that we're almost there because it is almost general relativity for this field G. And the other fields couple to this G field as if it was a metric for space time. And also the derivatives are taken with respect to well, our covariant derivatives with respect to this field. And so the theory effectively tells us that this graviton creates curvature in space time as, as is felt by all the other fields. And the only thing we need to know is to redefine G tilde mn equal to e to the four over d minus two phi minus the expectation value phi zero g mn and then we define a phi tilde that is phi minus phi zero and what we arrive to is the effective action one over two k squared integral over d the x square root of minus g tilde r tilde plus four over d minus two and all the fields that we are interested in as before minus one over twelve h double h minus two d minus twenty six over three alpha prime and here we have an additional factor of e to the four d minus two phi tilde. Okay, so at this point, we have cast this action with this redefinition of the matrix, and this is what is called the Einstein frame. While this, the, the same action written with this other convention is called the string frame, because this is what you arrive from uh, string theory, first principle, and then this is what instead you would arrive, you, you would want uh, to see if you are doing uh, gravity. But indeed, from string theory, we arrived to an action at low energy that reduces to gravity. Okay, and some fields couple to gravity. Okay, so I see it's five and 10. So maybe we make a small pause. I don't know, Claudio, how you. Yeah, <clears throat> it seems to me that this is a good point to stop for five mm -hmm. minutes. So we can resume uh, at a quarter past 11. And if there are questions, uh, it is a good time to, to ask. Okay, if there are no questions, then okay. Okay, we can resume in five minutes, okay? Okay. Okay, I think that we can resume the lesson, right? So, okay, okay. So, um, we discussed bosonic strings. Essentially, the spectrum was uh, made of bosons, and we have seen how gravity arises from it. But we know that in, uh, in nature, we all, we also have fermions. So, the same if we want string theory to be uh, a theory that accounts for all kinds of particles and interactions. We also want fermions. And the way to introduce fermions without spoiling all of our precious symmetries and results that we obtain uh, uh, until now is to use supersymmetry. Um, so essentially, uh, it is a symmetry that associates a, a particle of the opposite uh, spin statistics to each particle in nature, and they are called super partners, essentially. And we know that since we do not observe these super particles in nature, supersymmetry uh, must be broken or either don't exist if uh, someone uh, uh, doesn't like to conjecture too much. So, uh, but, but we can add supersymmetry on the world sheet action. And also, we have to remember that supersymmetry added on the world sheet action doesn't mean supersymmetry in target space. So it's a bit of a different topic. So we take supersymmetry together with the Polyakov action, and we obtain this action. And I will not talk of supersymmetry for many reasons. One is that it's not really my field of research, so my knowledge of it is very limited. And the other is because 
yeah, it's too broad of a topic on its own. And we also have broad topics to talk about. So, uh, and also my interest is very limited on the emergence of few fields in it. So I will just talk about these fields. So we have our metric. At this stage, we have the polyp of action. So our, our metric is, uh, um, our metric is essentially flat and then the graviton will induce curvature. So we have x m at x n. So this is the familiar one. And then we have the fermionic part, which is introduced with spinors on this wall sheet. Those are vectors of spinors with gamma matrices and the other. And this is the metric of space-time. Okay, so what are these objects? So psi m is a vector of spinor, which can be decomposed in the two components. And we can take it to be Majorana spinor. And this gamma matrix is the gamma, but in two dimensions. So there are two gamma matrices, gamma zero, looks like this, and gamma one looks like this. Okay, we don't have the usual uh, for gamma matrices. And so these are, the, this psi m are vectors with respect to target space and spinors on the world sheet. So uh, we want to write for the, let us consider the fermionic part of this action, and we can write it in a more convenient way, like this. I'm not writing the tau, the sigma anymore to save time, so the, the square sigma is the same. And then we have psi minus m, the plus psi minus m, plus psi plus m, the minus psi plus m, where these objects, the plus and the minus, of course, are given by uh, the plus is one half the tau plus the sigma, and the minus, guess what, is the tau minus the sigma. And then again, we, we want to do as before. We differentiate this action, perform a variation on the fermionic part of the action. And what we end up with, the integral. Um, okay, we, we take this boundary term, that is the one that we were interested in before. We again want to, to take a look at the boundary conditions. And we have psi minus m delta psi minus m minus psi plus m delta psi plus m sigma equal sigma one, sigma equal uh, zero. So this is the, the boundary term as we did for the bosonic part. And now what happens? Okay, uh, we didn't see before the spectrum for open strings. We jumped to the closed strings. But for the open strings, it was essentially similar, but easier because you only had one class of oscillators, not two with the level matching. So it was like N plus uh, some vacuum energy. And so you have uh, these modes labeled by only one kind of creation operators, number operators. And so for open strings, um, we choose psi plus tau zero equal to psi minus tau zero. So one of the conditions is free and the other is fixed. I mean, 
you can choose without using generality one or the other. Uh, we choose this and we analyze the other end of the strings, what happens. And what happens here is that you have two possibilities. So you can have psi plus m of tau and sigma one being equal to minus psi minus m of tau and sigma one, because of course this, these are built, these one are built with the squares essentially of psi. So it doesn't care about the sign. You can have a minus here or you can have a plus. And if you employ this uh, minus choice, this is a sector called uh, okay. I don't know how to pronounce this name. I don't know what language is this, but the other is Schwarz. And so I will only call the NS sector. And uh, the other choice gives you the Ramond. And so it's called usually R. These are two choices possible for these boundary conditions. OK, no, we are not really interested in these ones. We are interested in closed strings because something interesting happens there. We have closed strings. And what happens is that you have two kinds of modes, left and right moving. And for each mode, you can choose NS or R. And so you have four combinations possible. So you have four classes, which of course are NS, 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 R, R, NS, and R, R. <coughs> now, these boundary conditions here impose statistics on the watch. I mean, from the point of view of target space, uh, th this is all built with fermions, but these conditions tells you the behavior from the point of view of target space. So this gives rise to bosons. This gives rise to this two gives rise to fermions. For example, super super uh, super symmetric partners like Gravitino, Futino, and all the other Eno and S particles. But the one we are interested in more is this kind of sector. So this gives rise to bosons. Um, but it presents two uh, non-equivalent ground states. Two non-equivalent ground states. And the bosons it describes are uh, uh, forms. So you have uh, uh, forms of uh, higher and higher order. But these two sectors contains forms of with order of different uh, parity. So it works this way. You have a sector containing uh, one forms. Let's, let's generalize immediately. You have one sector containing two n plus one forms. So you have one called C1, C3, C5, C7, C9. And I don't go farther because uh, we have other things to, to discuss, but it stops here because uh, super strings live in 10 dimension and not in 26. So the dimensions at hand are ended. And another sector, another ground state contains 2n forms. So we have C0, C2, C4, C6, C8, and C10. I never saw this. I never worked with this sector here. But anyway, these even ones. And uh, these are called 
Ramon Ramon forms for obvious reasons. And these two ground states give rise to two versions of string theory, of super string theory. So this is called type 2A, and this is called type 2B. And you will work either with one or another. And I wanted to arrive at this point because the holographic model we will work with is derived from type 2A string theory. So these fields exist in this model and play an important role. And, and so uh, we have to see where they come from and what they are because we can just draw a bunch of forms that couple to strings. Um, okay, the other uh, important thing of these uh, super strings I just said is that it leaves the same argument that lead us to say that bosonic string live in 26 dimension, then super strings live in 10 dimensions. So we spare ourselves of 16 dimensions to work with. And the other important thing is that when you compute the quantum spectrum, there is no tachyon. The contributions from the bosons and the fermions cancel, and you don't have any more this, this ugly tachyon that makes the theory unstable. Okay, now that we have these elements, we introduce the last topic in string theory, which is the brains. Now, this is already a leap towards holography because these are objects that are tremendously important for holography, and holography was actually born uh, in the context of physics of deep brains. Now we already talked about these objects. And we talked about them when we saw the boundary conditions for the free string. And we saw that it could be bounded to some uh, higher dimensional surfaces. And uh, let us now take this. Uh, okay, let, let us make an argument more uh, qualitative instead of taking again the, the boundary conditions. So we let, let's assume that the, they can have these boundary conditions where the the string is bounded on some surface. Let us sketch again this object here, and let's have a string. That has his, his endpoints mounted here. Okay, now this seems legit for uh, boundary conditions without doing anything else, but if we have a problem, we have broken translational symmetry. Translations, translations, I don't know. So, uh, now you have an object in space that breaks translations. And so if you compute the conservation of uh, uh, the conservation of momentum, you find that it's not anymore uh, uh, conserved, and it's a problem. So the total momentum must be conserved. And uh, OK, breaks translations does not conserve. So total momentum must be conserved. And if you want to conserve this total momentum, what you have to do, you have to give dynamics to the surfaces. So this object here, this deep brain, other than being some uh, wall on which strings can end, it must also be a dynamic object if we want our theory to make sense. So the strings can pull it and excite it in many ways. And the total momentum is conserved if we do this way. OK, so in this way, the, the fluctuations 
on this embedding of the deep brain uh, can be uh, are described as scalars, and they can be seen as Nambu Goldstone bosons of the broken translational symmetry. So it, it, it's not uh, something new. <coughs> so let us take uh, the theory on uh, the world volume of this uh, of this brain. And it, it's essentially the theory of the string attached to the deep brain. So we take the mass formula for the open strings, and we didn't see it yet, but we see it now. And it's similar to the one for closed strings. So you have sum over i equals to one to d minus one, and the sum over n, which is another index of these oscillators. Now this index, just don't care about it. It's not important for us. It's more important this i minus one. And you see, you have only one kind of oscillators, and and uh, and they carry a space-time index, as the as we saw before for the closed strings. Okay, now this, if you are in presence of a deep brain, so you have uh, an open string, and this uh, i index can either be a long one direction in which the string has the Dirichlet boundary condition, or a long a string which this a long direction in which this string has Neumann boundary condition. So let us take first excited state. That's on, that's on the vacuum. And let us now consider a string, consider a string with the endpoints on a D, D brain, where P tells you how many direction it has the, the boundary condition being Dirichlet or Neumann. So, um, a, deep, a deep brain is what you obtain uh, when you set uh, um, Neumann boundary condition in p plus one direction. So, deep brain, questo, this means uh, Neumann boundary conditions on p plus one directions, including time, including let's say x0. OK, so we understand this p is the p space time <coughs> directions. And along all the others, you have no, you have Dirichlet boundary conditions. So uh, now we want to analyze the spectrum. And uh, the first excited state is this one carries one index. and this one index can be along the directions of the deep brain or transverse to the surface of the deep brain. Um, okay, so we have a string with an endpoint on this deep brain, and the general symmetry is SO one p times SO d minus p minus one. So it's the two rotational symmetries in the transverse space and on the brain. Okay, so. Instead of having rotations in all space, you have rotations parallel and transverse. And uh, so you have the two classes of this alpha i, alpha i. So the first class is transverse to the brain. Those are scalars under SO1P and vectors under SOD minus P minus one. And so this is the brain. Ah, writing with the wrong hand, brain. And this is 
the transfer space. And so these are excitations that describe the embedding in, in, uh, in target space. And so these are a group of D minus P minus one world volume scalars, which we call phi i. You change this phi i and the brain has a different embedding. You excite this phi i with some uh, vibrations and the brain vibrates. But then you can also have parallel to the brain. And so let us call this alpha A zero. Let us call A when it's parallel to the brain. And so it's a vector under SO one P. And so essentially it's a photon. Okay, we have a gauge field. So one index vector, okay, might as well call it a mu. And one of these direction is time. Okay, so we have discovered that deep brains provides us with some uh, gauge theory. Now, uh, let us write the action for these deep brains which will be the fundamental ingredient for us. And I'll try to be fast here. The action is due to three seniors. Uh, Dirac born Infeld. Dirac born Infeld. And this obtain uh, like an analogy to our previous section. So with the square root of the determinant of the metric. But this time we also have some uh, uh, fields that describe excitations of this uh, world volume. So we have this see, P, where P is the indicates the brain uh, dimensionality and D is still attention. Integral over D P plus one. So it's on the world volume. Psi is the coordinate we use to parameterize it. Minus the dilaton. And then we have minus the determinant of this object. There is the induced metric, as we would expect for a surface, for a volume functional. But there is also other fields. So there is this gauge field, which is the one related to alpha to a mu. And there is also another object which we will not care about, which is in this anti-symmetric form B a mu. B, A, B for us, but, but in our model, we'll be, we will always set it to zero, so it's not that important for us. NTP can be derived from uh, string theory calculations to be to the pi minus pi minus P alpha prime to the minus P plus one over two. Okay, so just to give this object. And now this is the theory for one brain, and this was this vector mu was a, a single field, so it was its gauge group was u one. When you generalize to non-abelian to to a stack of brains, so you can have a stack of n dp brains one on top of each other, and it becomes becomes a non-abelian gauge theory. The trace, and then you have d plus one, psi e to the minus t laton, and the same, minus determinant, gamma a b plus two pi alpha prime, and you have the non-abelian field strength, Okay, nice. So with these objects, we now have uh, something that can be regarded as uh, gluons or whichever uh, non-abelian uh, uh, non um, gauge field you would like to have. And the, now the, the action that governs the physics of the d is this one, but we also have 
an interaction with the Ramon Ramon sector, which again will be important for our uh, computation in holographic QCD. And so let us see coupling to area sector. So for point particles, we have that the word line essentially of a charged particle sources the gauge field. So you have a coupling like J mu, A mu. Okay, where J mu essentially tells you which is the word line of the charged particle. And uh, I mean, when you have all the integral. And um, here we have, we have P plus one objects. Okay, P plus one dimensional objects. That is the word line, the word volume of the D brains. Okay, so we don't have any more one dimensional word lines. And so what we expect is that we can have uh, a P dimensional action. This is unfortunate because of because of uh, the Poliakov action of before. Okay, it's the same. And we have TP integral over the DP word volume. Let's call it again word volume. Anyway, the dimensionality is already written there. And we have CP plus one. Okay, now, uh, now what's the deal? We have this coupling, of course, so the world volume of brains can be a source for Ramon Ramon fields, but we can have more couplings because we can have higher dimensions and they can couple to lower dimensional Ramon Ramon fold, to uh, lower order dimension, uh, lower order Ramon Ramon forms. And so the complete uh, action for a DP brain in the complete interaction with the Ramon Ramon sector of a DP brain can be written in a very convenient way. Instead of writing one term for every form, we can write like this, word volume, we have sum over n, cn, so we have one for every, for every form. We have the trace of e to the pi alpha prime, and here f is the, uh, indicates the field strength of the, that lives on the brain's world volume. Now, you can see that this F is not very well defined and we have an exponentiation of this F. And this has to be intended as to uh, expand the exponential. So this is like one plus two pi alpha prime f plus and so on and pick pick the appropriate the appropriate order. So if our brain, let's say, is a D eight brain. Okay, it lives in nine dimensions. This world volume is nine dimensional. And you will have it to be a source for the C9 form. It will have a coupling uh, with C7 times F. And you will have a coupling with C5, FF, and so on. And the total order in this integral, it's written in the language of forms, has to be nine. And in this way, you can just write this compact notation. And the last topic, which we will just report here for a string theory that will dive us directly into holography, is that the brains are not uh, objects that belong only to string theory as itself, but they can, only, can, can also be seen as uh, solitonic objects in supergravity. And so they are gravitational objects too. They exist in the low energy limit. And so the brains in supra stands for supergravity. 
And so a DP brain solution in supergravity, uh, I mean, wh what means to give a, sol a, a solution of supergravity? If it was gravity, we give the metric. Uh, if it's gravity with matter, we give the configurations of fields and gravity. And this is supergravity, so we have to give the metric and the suitable uh, supersymmetric fields. So we have this metric here with some functions that we now define. Now I explain what are all these objects. And then this object here. Okay, so this is the solution of supergravity for a, for a DP brain and the function HP of R is one plus L that depends on P over R to the seven minus P and uh, L P to the uh, seven P, seven P, yes, seven P is equal seven minus P, seven minus P is given by four pi uh, to the uh, I think it was four five minus p over two gamma function of seven minus pi minus, minus p over two which is strings and is the number of brains that you stack on top of another alpha prime to the seven minus p over two and uh, this r coordinate is the distance in transverse space okay and and then this and then you have coordinates that run along the deep brain and coordinates that are transverse to the deep brain. Okay, so this is the end of the string theory part. Just to say that deep brains can be regarded in two ways. In string theory as excitations of open strings. I mean, you have open strings that have to have endpoints fixer than the, the modes of the strings that end on this. The brain can describe the whole volume theory of the brain, but also can be regarded as gravitational object since they have a, a, a description in terms of supergravity. So they have these two phases. Okay, now, uh, okay, we have short time, but I would like to start this ADS-CFT part and because it connects immediately to this thing I said about deep brains. And I would like to do it now that you have uh, seen it just now. So the holographic uh, idea is that you can describe gauge theories uh, with the higher dimensional theories of gravity. Okay, then you have various degrees of strength of this, uh, of this idea. You can have uh, uh, gauge theories dual to string theories, so you can have gauge theories only dual to uh, supergravity, or you can have gauge theories dual to the quantum version of string theory, uh, to, to full quantum string theory. So um, it really depends on how you tune the parameters on both sides of your string theory and uh, 
and the gauge theory. So to see how it was born, we have to go back to 97 when Maldacena uh, wrote this now world famous paper. And what he did to reach this idea was to analyze a stack of N D3 brains. So we will start with this stack of this huge stack of N D3 brains. And so since we have P is odd for us, it couples to P plus one Ramon Ramon fields, which is even, and this tells us that we are in type two B string theory. Okay, just just as a reminder. Okay, now we take the stack of the brains and we look at it in its two faces. So it's the same object described in two ways. The red line, and on the right, on this on the left, we have the open string picture. And on the right, we have the gravity or a closed string picture because we see that we saw that gravity comes from the closed string sector. Okay, let us now describe these uh, brains as uh, excitations of open strings. So um, we embed these in uh, we have the embedding in Minkowski flat space nine plus one dimension. Okay, we start from string theory, string theory as flat space, and then the metric does what it does. Um, the embedding is described by xi being equal to zero with i that goes from four to nine. And then we take uh, we take a low energy limit by going at energies of scale much lower than inverse string length, and so we analyze only massless excitations. So. What is the action for our for our stack of brains? Now we have an open string sector plus a closed string sector, and then we have some interaction between them. I mean, as an effective action at low energy. So the closed string sector how it behaves? We have seen it. It's one over two k tilde squared, if I remember correctly, integral over ten d ten x square root of minus g e to the minus two pi, and then we have r plus four, and then we have some dilaton here, and then we have other fields, and we don't really care about that much, and. We can linearize in the low energy regime. So the metric is that of flat space plus some correction of order k times some fluctuations h, small fluctuations around flat. And what we arrive to is that the closed sector is approximately given by a 10 dimensional integral of linearized version of gravity plus correction of order k. We turn to the open sector. And what we have? 2 pi, 1 over 2 pi g string. And we have, we are essentially expanding the DBI action. We have a square root with a gauge field inside and a dilaton in front. We expand it. And what we get is a four dimensional action one fourth F 
mu nu at mu nu uh, plus other stuff that we don't really care about. Let, let's just write this. Let's just write the, okay, this is for the embedding by the new by. Let's just write this plus other terms of order alpha prime. Okay, so this phi here is not the big phi that is the dilaton. This is the, the scalars that I told before, it's the embedding of the trains. And now let us talk about the interactions. Again, from the DBI action, if you remember, we had the dilaton times the square root of something. E, e to the dilaton times the square root of something. So it couples the dilaton to the gauge fields. And so we have again the four dimensional integral. It's phi, the dilaton, f mu nu, f mu, plus higher order in the expansion of the DBI action. Uh, now, let us now take a limit where alpha prime goes to zero. Okay, this means, what does this mean? This means that alpha prime was inverse to the string tension. So the string tension is very big and the strings are very small. So it, it amounts to send the strings back to being almost point-like. And so what happens? The open sector goes to M equal four super young mills with two pi gs being identified with g yamit squared because these terms die, this dies. And this interaction term, we will see, but it dies too. So the closed string sector what happens? It becomes free supergravity. And what solution has free supergravity? Well, 10 dimensional flat space. And S interaction goes to zero. And why goes to zero? Because it, it looks like this is at the same order of the others, but if you go to the closed string sector as before, you see that to, to uh, normalize this, to have the, the kinetic term canonically normalized, you have to rescale it. And when you rescale, you obtain some alpha prime factor and this also goes to zero. And so what you obtain now is two uh, non-interacting sectors. You have a, you have a four-dimensional uh, theory, which is super young mills with n equal four supercharged, and it's a formal field theory. And its coupling is obtained with this identification with the string coupling. And on the other side, you have 10-dimensional flat space. Okay, now have some patient and patience and bear with me, and we go to the to the gravitational description of the deep brains. So if we look at the brains as gravitational objects, so as a source for closed strings, if you want, in the, in, the, in the philosophy of string theory, its geometry is given by h to the minus one half, uh, the x mu, the x mu, mu down this time. plus h to the one half delta ej, the xi, the xj, and we have e to the two phi that equals to the string coupling squared, and we have a C4 Ramon Ramon form, one minus h of r to the minus one, the x zero wedge, the x1 wedge, the x2 wedge, 
the x3 with the, all of this with the h being 1 plus l over r to the fourth and with l to the fourth being 4 pi gs n alpha prime squared okay so this is our identifications okay now um, we can identify two regions in this geometry and the, the shape of the function h suggests already what to do we go to l and let's look it in the other way let's go to r greatly lower than L and this is what it means it means that uh, we uh, have sorry it's the opposite R greatly I mean very far from the brains okay let's talk let's talk how we eat for R uh, very big Uh, we recover flat space. H of R is essentially one. Okay, yes, this one goes to zero. And we recover flat space time. Because we go there and here is one, one, and it's all flat space. But if we go to R, a lot smaller than this curvature scale, so very close to the brain that are sourcing this geometry. What we find is that this time is the one, is this factor one here that is negligible compared to this big L over R factor. And so what we obtain is uh, that H of R can be approximated with L to the fourth over R to the fourth. And when I plug it into the metric, I find R squared over L squared, the X mu, the X mu, something L squared over R squared, delta EJ, the X, the XJ. And if now I perform the substitution Z equal to L squared over R, I see that this metric becomes L squared over Z squared eta mu nu dx mu dx nu plus dz squared plus L squared times the metric of a five sphere of radius cell. Okay, so we have found very close to the brain, what we see is an ADA is 5 space time times an S5. So we have two types of strings now. So let us put ourselves very far from the brain and ask, we ask what, what we see. What is the low energy theory that we see at this point? We place a cell very far where gravity is weak. And we ask ourselves what kind of excitations of low energy we see. So there are two kinds, two types of closed strings that propagate in this space time. One kind propagates in 10 dimensional flat space. And we are at infinity and we see them all around us. They don't carry a lot of energy. But then we have also the one propagating in ADS5 times S5. And when we take the low energy limit, those strings can have, um, the strings excitations can have very high energy. But this doesn't mean that we have to integrate out and only look at 10 dimensional flat space when we do the low energy approach. Because the you see, if we are at infinity, the energy that we measure at infinity, we take a look at the metric and we see an energy for a state 
that is this one. At the certain hour, we see this, this uh, energy here. And, and so the energy that we see at infinity can be very small because of the redshift, of the gravitational redshift, essentially. OK, so what we end up with is that we have two descriptions of the same object. But these two descriptions give similarities and differences. So on one side, we have, uh, we have that the deep brains can be described with 10 dimensional, let's say 10, 10 dimensional Minkowski is easier. 10 dimensional Minkowski. And with n equal 4, 4 dimensional super young Mills uh, gauge theory. And on the other side, we have 10 dimensional Minkowski. But also gravity in ADS5 times S5. And so, since these two descriptions should describe the same object and they have the same, fa the same factor here, can we say that these two theories that are completely different and live in different dimensions and contain, seem, they, they seem to contain different degrees of freedom, they describe the same physics? Okay, so this is the core of the ADS CFT conjecture. And it's ADS for obvious reasons, because we have obtained ADS space. And it's CFT, because this object here is a conformal field theory. And uh, we will see that the fact, it's called ADCFT not only for this example here, but because on one side, having the ADS space, is strictly related to the theory being conformal. Um, now, I leave you, but before I give you a small map on this uh, on these um, constants that appeared in the theory. And uh, let me see if I can. No, okay, I give you next time. No, no need to give you now, uh, since it's six ten. Okay, let's stop here. That we arrived at a at a good point uh, conceptually, Let's see some birth of holographic principle. Okay, so thank you, Lorenzo, for uh, this very interesting introduction. So, um, are there any questions? Oh. Sorry, I just uh, just give a couple of uh, contain all this stuff and maybe mm -hmm. interested and are very useful uh, even for beginners because the ones I studied when I was in master thesis and it's the the three back for string theory. Uh, I think it's the first lecture, first uh, first course in string theory. The first course in string theory, and for the gauge gravity duality, it's the uh, Amon Erdmenger. And if I remember correctly, this one is called gauge gravity duality. And so both are, uh, are very, I mean, you can read without having known anything about these topics before, so. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo. So if there are no questions, I uh, stop the recording.